The referee doesn't want to bring up put him in a mouth. Right. Yeah. True. That. She said, um, you know, she did the dish with the plate. Yes, I saw that. She said it worked out really good.
We're going to sing, Oh, Worship the King. Feel free to look at the words on the screens or in your hymnals on page 104. We're going to do the first, second, and fifth verses only. Oh, Worship the King.
So if I understand correctly, was it Eleanor is a baby? Eleanor is a baby with regards to heart surgery and doing well. We're thankful for that. Uh, or there's also wedding that's taking place today. I heard you say Stephanie. What was the first name? Justin. Justin and Stephanie, who are getting married today. And then also another graduation that's on its way. So we've had three you know, graduates to celebrate today. So we want to be mindful of that. Thank you for sharing. James. So many challenges that 
even for Jacqueline, we pray and trust in you, O oh God, for all life as it has been seen. Let us not be immune, let us not grow in the word, let us not be afraid. Let's be willing to share the hope that we have with you. This will be a place that people would want to come to know and understand and love. So continue to do this, we ask this in Christ. Amen. As always, as a sign and a sense of share in what we believe, we do the Apostles' Creed together. It just shares with us in a snapshot, but it's also just a historical aspect of things, of what shares throughout the ages, about what we believe and what we trust. So if this is your first time, don't be afraid to look on the screens and say these words the Apostles' Creed with us. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, is only begotten Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he come to judge the living. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy universal Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the blessed. For any transition to singing Amazing Grace, you may stay seated. Feel free to stay seated in your seats. The words will be on the screen, so if you'd like to look at your hymnals, feel free to turn to page 343. We're going to sing the first, second, and fifth stanzas only. Amazing Grace.
candles that we light every week um, are two traditions that we have for our candles. Um, one is that uh, we typically have our, our gold cross sitting behind uh, the Word of God, right? Uh, now we have a bigger wooden cross that we've kept up since Easter, which has been very helpful actually during these sermons, during the sermon series. Uh, but the, the lights of the candle uh, can be seen either going out into the world from Christ or us coming in to worship Christ. So either, however you're visioning it, it's beautiful, and it's a beautiful picture of what we, uh, who we are uh, in bringing our light to Christ or bringing Christ's light into the world. Now, <clears throat> getting back to propitiation and, and expiation, if I would take one of these beautiful candle holders and hold it here, some of you would start to get a little nervous, like, what is the pastor doing? One, for those who are not aware, is that there's oil in our candles to help them burn well. And I appreciate Bob is very faithful in making sure that they are lit every week. Okay, so good job, Bob. This is one of those little tasks that you always take for granted. Um, and so, so we appreciate that. But if I had that and I was holding it, and I'm not going to because I would totally do what I'm about to say. But if I had it and I was talking and I had the candle held right here and I would spill it and tumble the candles over uh, here, the fire would probably catch fire on the carpet and the oil, and there would be a mess of oil and fire. And there would be gasps everywhere. Not about if I was okay, but about the carpet. And probably Dave would come over and tackle me <laughs> from saying, what are you doing holding the candles right here in the first place? And so, but if that would happen, there would be a problem because I will have sinned against you all for not taking care of our carpet to mishandle any candles. Candles, I think there's a tag on the back, do not handle candles, you know, while they're lit kind of thing. But if I did that and the, the carpet would catch on fire, you all would probably be mad at me for good reason because I heard our carpet, our beautiful carpet here in our sanctuary, right? That would be a problem. And so some of you would be very upset because there's some memories probably of this carpet, either your kids crawling on the carpet or whatnot. No, no, no crawling on the carpet. But there would be individuals mad and the church would be upset saying, we have a problem because we have a defunct carpet. And I would say, it's okay. I'm just going to, I'm going to come over here and I'm going to cut some of the carpet over here and I'm going to patch the holes over here. And Wayne, it's already laughing like, wrong. And then you say, no, Jeff, we need to have the whole carpet changed. That would be what we would need to do to make it right, to have things restored the way it's supposed to be. And I would say, I'm sorry, I can't afford that. But there was a generous donor in the back that says, it's okay, I'll cover the cost of the carpet. And not just any carpet, the best carpet even has gold inlays, 24 karat inlays in this carpet. But what that's doing is it's propitiation. I'm getting, I am uh, uh, having your anger satisfied at me because the carpet has been restored better than ever. That's the propitiation. But there's still a problem, right? I still sin. So anytime I come close to the candles, everybody's going to be a little nervous. What's going to happen? Until I say, either I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, it was a lapse of judgment. I don't know what I was doing. And then you say, okay, I forgive you. Or I have an advocate. Like Jacob said, I've talked to Jeff. He is super remorseful. He's crying. He can't believe he did it. He's so embarrassed. Please forgive him. And as we saw last week, Jesus is our advocate. And Jesus is saying, Jeff, I know him. I know him. I love him. And he is sorry. And so as we talked about the goats, the sin offering goat and the scapegoat, so Jesus gives the propitiation of giving forgiveness, and, it's, uh, and, and God's anger has been relieved, or our expiation, and that he is our scapegoat, and he takes on our sin for us. So our sin is forgiven, we're cleansed, and we no longer have God's anger against us. And so hopefully that may help some of you that were totally lost last week with propitiation. You just think the carpet would be burning holes in it, and hopefully that will help with that. But it helps us because this week is about God knowing us. And for God to know us, he knows the good things and the bad things. 
And even though God knows the worst things about us, he still loves us and is still coming to be our sacrifice. And so we see this in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. It says this, And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him truly is the love of God perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. This is the word of the Lord in our hearing this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your love, for your grace. And we thank you for this time together in your word. Father, we pray that you would Calm our hearts. Father, I don't know what we're bringing into this service this morning. There's many plans coming in the coming weeks, whether it's graduations, weddings, other celebrations, picnics. And so, Father, all of those can be a distraction of things that we need to do in, in places that we are rather than here. So, Father, I pray that we would just put all those to the side. Father, that we would enter into this time now that we would take this as a moment to get closer to you, to go deeper and understand your love for us in a new way. So, Father, I pray that you would renew us this morning. Father, help us to know you and to love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Give us ears to hear, hear, and eyes to see you. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as I'm reading through this passage, there's a number of questions that I have. I don't know what questions you are, you have, but one, how do we know God? Um, why or how do we keep his commands? How, how does knowing God and how does that affection for God transform us? And how can we have assurance? Those are the things that we're looking at. And as I go through this passage, it, it reminds me of a previous passage that we focused on for a time, and that's from John 15. So I want us to just go back and read these these verses in John 15, because they should sound familiar even in this, these short four verses that we read this morning. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11 says this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, that it is, excuse me, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be. Now, as we've been reading through the first chapter and the first few verses of chapter 2, hopefully this sounds familiar. This is a lot of the terminology, terminology that John has been using. And so this is one of the beautiful things about seeing the Bible as this is a real person, John the Beloved, that loved Jesus, that spent time with Jesus. And this message that Jesus was giving about being the vine, you know, we are the branches, and that his father is the vine dresser, right? that those are all impactful, and that impacted John, the person. Not just as an arbitrary book in the Bible, but John heard the, these words, and these words in, in the Gospel of John were transformative to him. And that is what he is bringing in his ministry to these churches of Ephesus. And he is saying, if we know him, we keep his Commands. Just like he says in verse 
5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it is he that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so here, this word abide, abiding in Jesus, who Jesus is, knowing Jesus, loving Jesus, is transformative. And so knowing Jesus, not just knowing about him, is crucial. Because I can know a lot of things about my wife, but do I know my wife? One of the commentaries said this, and we begin by, what is the most used word in the passage we have this morning? Anybody? Anybody? By. That's one of the words in the John passage. In the first John passage, we have the word know four different times in these four verses. Right? John's test in uh, chapter 2, verses 3 through 6 is the test of obedience to God's commands. Notice how many times the word know occurs in this passage, four times in the ESV and in the Greek text. By this we know that we have come to know him. Whoever, whoever who says, I know him, by this we may know that we are in him. God wants you to know something. Your salvation is not a matter of guesswork. You don't have to worry and wonder if you are truly a believer or not. God actually wants you to have assurance of your salvation. The first no in verse 3 is in the present tense Greek. If you're like, what in the world is that, Jeff? Come on, get us out of seminary. What does this mean? The idea is a progressive knowledge that is gained by experience. The sense is we are continually being able to know that we have come to know God. So, what does that mean? It means the older we get, the more time we spend with God, the more we experience His goodness, the more we experience His grace, and the more we know God. So being older is a blessing. The second note in this perfect tense, emphasizing that we have come to know Him, in a real, genuine, and complete way. Yarborough captures the sense of the Greek verb tense well. This is how we maintain the awareness that we have come to know him fully. So at times, the second form of know God is in the same way that they use uh, to consummate a marriage. To know your spouse. Now, am I ever going to know you ever fully know been ready to celebrate 25 years in a uh, few weeks, and I still have a lot to learn. <laughs> but I know her. There's often times, I don't know, husbands, if you do this, I do this, and I know it's Amber, where uh, I will say something or do something, put something out, and she's like, What do you think? Do you think I'm going to say this? Do you think I'm going to do this? Do you think I want this? Like I'm doing it before it happens because of how well I know her over time. Sometimes that gets on her nerves. And so here, what we, what I want us to know, what I want us to hear, is that God is knowable. Not just, I know facts about God. I'm the best Bible bowl champion there is. Give us a trivia night just on Jesus and God, and I'm going to win it. Because there's a difference between knowing about God and actually knowing who he is. So the next question comes, comes up, what is he talking about commands? What commands is he referring to? Well, this is a preview for next week, but in 1 John 9 through 11, he says this, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I know, it makes it crystal clear. But we've been talking about God is light, complete light. There is no darkness in God. Right? He's perfect, unblemished, complete. We are not. And so here, he is talking about loving his brother, loving others, Whoever does that abides in the light. Who is the light? God. But in Matthew 22, uh, verses 36 to 34, he makes it a little bit more clear. Matthew 22, 
Matthew 22, 36 says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the law and the prophet. So again, we talked a lot last week from the book of Leviticus. All the laws that are there, all the commandments that are there. And Jesus goes and sums it up in just a couple of sentences. So what are the commandments that we have to follow? Love God. Love our neighbor. No big deal. Right? And so the question is, what do we love? Do we love God? Do we love our neighbor? Those are the, the, the tough questions. And do we love them at the utmost? We were talking about this in our men's Bible study on Thursday, that we just don't have enough words for love. We were talking recently, or in, in that study, about the, the number of words the uh, Inuit uh, Eskimos uh, have the word snow. How many was that, Ralph? Do you remember? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay. There's 700,000 words in the Oxford English Dictionary. Dictionary. And but they have like 15 to 20 words for snow. You know, wet, moist snow, sleet, uh, hard packed snow, you know, powdered snow. All these different types of snow, there's a different word for each of them. How many words do we have for love? One. Really? But, I love the St. Louis Cardinals, well, kind of. My love is diminishing at the moment. Maybe more for the front office than anything else. But, I love Cardinals. I love, I love my, uh, our pets, Crypto, Newt, and Selena, our two dogs and our cat. I love those. I love tea, I love comic books. Now, if I take those same words and say, honey, I love you, it's not the same, and it shouldn't be the same. One of the things that often couples fall into, you go out to have dinner, and you're looking around, and you see couples, what do you see often? Are they talking? Nope. Leanne's got it. They're looking at each other, no, they're looking at the phone. One of my neighbor's biggest pet peeves is when, especially if we're out together on a date night and I'm here rather than here. Because what am I communicating? What's the most important? Here. What do I love? Here or here, not here. And so here in the text, what we see, what John is wanting us to see and to know is that the love of God, the love of Jesus, the love that, that John has for Jesus, hearing Jesus, still hearing him here as he's writing this letter to the Ephesian church, or the church in Ephesus, has transformed him, and they want the, the people to love Jesus as much as he does. He wants them to love and to know Jesus and his words, his transforming words, like he does. He wants them to experience the same thing does. And that is why he's writing this letter. This is why he's writing this warning against the cessation that's trying to get people to leave the church, to get people to leave their faith. <clears throat> because he knows and has experienced the love of God and what it does inside of a person. And he wants them to understand the same thing. So whenever we love God, I've said this statement before, it's, 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 a, it's a book title, but you are what you love, but you may not love what you think. Again, I'll say that again. You are what you love, but you may not love what you think. Because for many of us, we may say we love God, but there are other priorities. So in essence, when we're talking about love and the declensions of what we love, we may love our spouse more than God. We may love our stuff more than God. We might, 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 we might love the lake more than God. So the question is, 
Whatever we love is what we look to consume. Sometimes what we love is we love information. We like to be knowledgeable, so we consume information, news, we uh, internet, uh, Twitter, or X, or whatever they call it these days. We, we consume all this information, not necessarily because we love information, we might, but we also love to be seen as a knowledgeable in in person. So that people come to me and they can say, hey, what are your thoughts on this? But the problem is, especially if you consume the news all the time, you're not going to be a very happy person. Because <laughs> the news is not very happy. And so here, if you consume the love of Jesus, if you understand what he has done for you, if you understand the grace that you have received, if you, if you consume that every day, that is going to turn you into a gracious person, a merciful person. And that's why John is saying, if you follow the commands of God, if you know, if you know Jesus, you're going to do what he asks you to do. So I get so irritating whenever I come into the kitchen and the dishes are still in the sink. I'm so excited they're at least in the sink. They're not in the dishwasher. My kids are not following my thinking, my commands. Do they love me? I don't know. They probably do. Maybe. But this is a transformation that happens. And Brenda Manning says this. The personal transformation of a Christian is a mystery that cannot be pierced. But the effects of the transformation are set forth clearly in the New, New Testament. So clearly, in fact, that we try to obscure them. The bottom line is that the transparent Christian resembles Jesus, becomes a professional lover who is motivated by compassion in all that he or she thinks, says, and does, in whatever language. Paul describes his personal metamorphosis putting on Christ, in these ways, putting on Christ, living in Christ, Christ living in the Christian, or life in the Spirit, all point to the revolutionary change in our personal lives, our values, our habits, and our attitudes. If we are true to this Christian love, it may kill us, impoverish us, or disgrace us. In any event, we are sure to lose at some of the good lose at least some of the goods of this world, which Jesus took the trouble to point out are, are of no importance anyway. This is what Paul means when he speaks 164 times of life in Christ. In our lives, yours and mine can be played out on this high note of love because God lodged within us is the power perhaps laying dormant to make every thought, feeling, passion, and emotion in full expression of our spirit self, of our life in Christ, saying here's our hearts and the power to unify and to make whole and total self so that everything we have and are formed by one personality, and that's Jesus Christ, living and loving inside of us. Or, as John puts it, if Christ is abiding in you, if he is always there, he is always transforming us. He is always asking us how we love first. I love that, being a professional lover. There was a church once that had their values. I can't remember all of them because only one makes the story funny. And one of their values was love, which it should be. That's what a church should be known for. But they decided to make a pastor on each of their values. So one was probably worship. So you had a worship pastor. And another one was probably outreach. So there was probably an outreach pastor. That's a value. So you can imagine this pastor's title was the pastor of love, which I, if I have an actual title, that's what I would want to be known as, the pastor of love, because that sounds amazing, especially at Valentine's Day. But that's what we all should have. We should be people who are professional lovers and to take love, as these candles say, out with us wherever we go. That should be how people identify us. And as we have this identification, what we see, as we know God, as we keep his commands, as he transforms us, we know and we show that we are not a liar, 
as we are keeping his commands and the truth that is in us. It's opposite of verse 4. But as we do this, as we know God, as we, as we love God, as we are on this journey to get to know God more, to help others get to know more, that love is perfected in us. That can be your neighbors. It can be family members. It can be one another. But whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So this gives us assurance. If we are walking in the way that Jesus walked, and we're not being perfect, John's not saying about being perfect. He's saying walk and, and live according to the commands of Christ. The question is, are we being like Christ? Are we, are we like Jesus? How are you being like Jesus today? What on your agenda today is showing the love of Jesus? Tomorrow, this week, who are you showing Jesus' love to? If people see you, they first think, man, that person is a loving, generous, gracious person. Or, man, that person is a bitter, angry person that I just I hate being around. Assurance is, of salvation is a God-given confidence for every true believer in Christ for their present approval and future acceptance by their Father. And so what we have, and there are a number of people that I've spoke to over the years that struggle Am I a believer? Am I truly saved? And I don't know that may be you. That may be maybe some family members, maybe your kids struggle with this. Now the truth is we all are going to have doubts at some point. It's just going to happen. We all are going to go through, not if, but when, we go through difficult times and we feel God far off. We're always going to have doubts. But what John wants us to know, the question that he brings us to, is that we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. What are his commands? Loving God and loving others. And so are you doing that? So if you struggle with your assurance, if you struggle with, am I really a Christian? Well, the fact that you're asking the question is a good sign that you care about your salvation. You care about God. You care about where you are and where you stand with God. And so as we experience God's grace and his propitiation and his expiation, we can have assurance because we know God and he is transforming us. From the day we, we met him to this day to tomorrow, he's always with us. He never leaves us loves us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness, for your grace. We thank you that you help us to know you intimately, and us knowing you helps to transform us, to show others the same type of love and grace you have shown us. Father, that you have shown us love and grace by sending Jesus live the perfect life that we were supposed to live. To die the death that we deserved. Father, and to defeat death and to rise from the dead so that we can experience eternal life with the Father through Jesus. So Father, I pray that we would continue to see a deeper relationship with you every day. That we would seek to read your word, not because we have to, but because we get to. Father, I pray that you would help us today to show your love to others in some way, shape, or form. Whether it be a kind gesture, a text message, a letter. But Father, I pray that you would help us today to show your kindness through us in some way, shape, or form. Father, we pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. So these past few messages set up our communion very well. Because those of us who come to take communion, who come to the table, 
we are saying that we trust in the work of Jesus on our behalf. That this is a meal that we don't bring anything to. This is a feast that we don't bring the cranberry sauce or the green bean casserole or whatever. Turkey, whatever you may. I'm talking about Thanksgiving. I must be hungry. But what we, when we come to this meal, Jesus brings all that we need. And it is a feast. It is a feast of his goodness, a feast of his grace. As we talked about last week, there were two goats that were utilized to bring atonement on the Day of Atonement to the Jewish people. One would be a sin offering, the other one would be the scapegoat. Jesus was both for us. That on the cross, Jesus made propitiation for our sins by taking away God's anger, by paying the penalty for us. So that we do not have payment, we do not have penalty. Jesus paid it for us. And we have been washed clean because Jesus has taken on our sins on the cross and has washed us clean. So as long as we put our faith in the work of Jesus and his perfect life as the perfect substitute, not just death and his resurrection, we can have a relationship with God and, and we can have relationship with one another in honesty, integrity, and grace. So whenever we take the elements, we're acknowledging that. So if you're here today, I want to encourage you. Do you make that acknowledgement? Do you trust Jesus to make you right with God and to cleanse you of your sin? And I would like to invite you to take communion with us. Here in a moment, our ushers are going to come forward. We're going to have a corporate confession of sin. This is a uh, uh, confession that we say together, acknowledging our sin, our need for Jesus, our need for propitiation. And then the ushers will pass out the elements for us to consider God's goodness and His grace. And then we will hear an assurance of pardon that we have been cleansed, the expiation of our sin. So we will receive our assurance of pardon. We'll hear the words of the institution and then I'll encourage us to eat and drink together. Ushers, would you like to come forward, please? So our corporate confession of sin will be on the screen. I want to encourage you to read aloud with me. Almighty God, we acknowledge and confess we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Even within us our sorrow for the wrong we have done and the good we have left undone. Lord, you are full of compassion and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. 
God and Savior, Jesus Christ, gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself our people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Thanks be to God for this inexpressible gift. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, after, taking, after giving thanks, he took the bread and he broke it. In the same way, he took the cup and after pouring it out, said, This is the blood of the new covenant. As often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim my death until I return. When you're ready, please take it. Thank you. 